Hey guys, welcome to Bible class for Monday. We're getting into Philippians chapter one. So today we're gonna be seeing an introduction to Philippians and then the outline for Philippians one. A beautiful book and even though last week I said that I thought, <laughs> look, I thought Ephesians was the last book that we were gonna study together besides Revelation. And I had already planned on studying Philippians. So I have like in my notebook, the plan, and I go to do the homework sheets and I'm like, I promise you that I had just told them that we were only doing Ephesians and then we were in Revelation for the entire time. But that is not true because what I ended up seeing is that the days that we do Revelation for history class, that those days we can do Philippians for Bible class because there's only four chapters. So what we're going to do is this week we're going to have Philippians 1 and 2. And then next week we'll have Philippians 3 and 4. Okay, and that will be the last book besides Revelation that we're going to study. Which I'm really excited about because Philippians is path full, you guys, of amazing verses. Every chapter has verses that are just like, they just hit you in your heart. Okay, and I know that a lot of you guys... One of your favorite verses is the one that comes in Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me, right? And so there's just amazing verses like that. You know, um, verses like that God gives us peace that passes all under understanding. Um, humility of Christ, the fact that he took on the form of a man and humbled himself. And that's why we can do the same thing. Um, the verse in, in chapter 1 that talks about um, the prayer that Paul has. For the Philippian church, which is a prayer that every leader should have for the people that they serve and the people that they lead. And so there's amazing chap verses that fill these pages of Philippians 4. So I'm excited to get into it today. So let's pray and we'll get started. We're not going to do our verse activity today. We're not going to talk about the verse today. We'll talk about it tomorrow when we have a little bit more time because um, I don't want to put in Philippians introduction, Philippians 1, and the verse activity all at the same time. Maybe we can keep this video down to 30 minutes. Maybe not. I guess you'll know because at the end, you you can, I mean, at the beginning, you can already see how long the video is. Not me when I'm making it. <laughs> okay, so we'll see what happens. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for today and thank you for each of these students. Thank you for the things that you have done in our lives this year, for the things that you've taught us. Um, I pray that you be with each of the students as they um, start this week, that they're almost finished with this year, Lord, and it has been a hard year. It has been a difficult one for everybody, and I just pray that you help them finish the year out strongly, that you guide them, that you give them the focus that they need, that you continue to work in their hearts, Lord, because we all have areas that we need to improve in. We all have areas that we need to grow and mature in and all have areas where we need to become closer to you in. And I pray for each of these students, for their souls, that you continue to work with them, that their heart doesn't get hard from being in this world, Lord, that you keep them um, in this world, but not of this world. Lord, I pray that you um, work in them like you worked in your disciples, that you pray and make intercession for them in front of God like you made intercession for your disciples that we're supposed to be in this world, Lord, so that we can be lights for you. But we have to continually surrender to you every day so that we don't become exactly like the world, Lord. I pray that you be with each of these students today as we get into Philippians, that they see the treasure that's in every chapter and um, apply it to their lives and become stronger in you because of it. We love you so much in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, guys, so the very first thing you're going to do is watch the Bible Project video on Philippians. Going to give you a great um, idea of the themes. He's writing it from prison. Philippians is a church. You're not going to hear a lot of... Um... Okay, this is funny, all right? Not funny, but like a complete opposite. In, Re in, in Revelation today, I imagine some of you guys... I don't know how you guys do your schedule, but I know some of you guys start with Bible. What you're going to see in history class today is that we're going to be in Revelation in the Church of Laodicea because it's t contemporary history. Okay, that's what that book is right now, contemporary history. So um, what you're going to see is the church, the, the letter to the Church of Laodicea had no animo, had no edification, had no like, okay, good job for this, but here, let's work on this. No, it was all like, you need to work on this because you got a problem, okay? 
in the church of Philippi, who they're, um, Paul is writing this letter to, they have nothing bad, only good, <laughs> okay? There's not a lot of like, hey, don't forget you're not doing this right. Hey, like the Ephesians and the Corinthians and, and, and the Romans and different stuff like that. Mm -mm, no, this church was a church that was fully on board, fully involved with Christ in the life and ministry of Paul. Even so much that they have um, a member of the church that goes to give Paul a donation, a monetary donation, who risked his life to help Paul. And he's going to talk about that a little bit in the second chapter. And it's mentioned in the video today. So this is a fun book on top of the fact that it has treasure on top of treasure for verses. It's a fun book because there's no like, hey, you're not doing this right. No, it's all like, wow, how cool. Animo, 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 right? And truth and God's word and promises that we can lean on. So we're going to have fun getting into the book. So first thing you do, watch the video. <clears throat> Take notes on the video, half a page notes. It'd be good to give yourself like an outline. That's what I did with mine when I was taking the notes from the video. Give yourself an outline of the book that helps you stay focused as we go chapter by chapter and helps you on your summary afterwards. So go ahead and watch that and then we'll get into the book. Paul's letter to the Philippians. The church in Philippi was the first Jesus community Paul started in Eastern Europe, and that story is told in Acts chapter 16. Philippi was a Roman colony in ancient Macedonia. It was full of retired soldiers, and it was known for its patriotic nationalism. And so there, Paul faced resistance when he was announcing Jesus as the true king of the world. And after Paul moved on from there, those who became followers of Jesus continued to suffer resistance and even persecution, but they remained a vibrant community faithful to the way of Jesus. Paul sent this letter from one of his many imprisonments, and for a very practical reason. The Philippians had sent one of their members, Epaphroditus, to take a financial gift to Paul to support him in prison. And Paul sent back this letter with Epaphroditus to say thank you and to do a whole lot more. The design of this letter doesn't develop one single idea from beginning to end like many of Paul's other letters. Rather, Paul has arranged a series of short, reflective essays or vignettes, and they all revolve around the center of gravity in this letter, which is a poem in chapter 2. It artistically retells the story of the Messiah's incarnation, his life, death, and resurrection, and exaltation. And then in each of these vignettes, Paul will take up key words or ideas from that poem to show how living as a Christian means seeing your own story as a lived expression of Jesus' story. So Paul opens the letter with a prayer of gratefulness, and he thanks God for the Philippians' generosity, for their faithfulness, and he expresses his confidence that the life-transforming work that God has begun in them will continue into greater and more beautiful expressions of faithfulness and love. And Paul then focuses on their obvious concern at the moment, which is his status in prison. Being in a Roman prison was no picnic, but it paradoxically has turned out for good to advance the good news about Jesus. So all of the Roman guards, the administrators, they all know that Paul's in prison for announcing Jesus as the risen Lord. And his imprisonment, it's inspired confidence in other Christians to talk about Jesus more openly. And Paul's optimistic that he will be released from prison, but it's possible that he could be executed. And as he reflects on it, that actually wouldn't be so bad because for me, Paul says, life is the Messiah. And so dying would be a gain. For Paul, his life in the present and in the future, it's defined by the life and love of Jesus for him. And so if he's executed, that means he'll be present with Jesus, which would be great for him. And if he's released, well, that would mean he could keep working to start more Jesus communities, which would be better for other people. And so that's what he hopes for. And notice how his train of thought works here. Dying for Jesus is not the true sacrifice for Paul. Rather, it's staying alive to serve others. And so that's Paul's way of participating in the story of Jesus, to suffer in order to love others more than himself. Paul then turns to the Philippians and he urges them to participate in Jesus' example by taking up this same mindset. He says, your life as citizens should be consistent with the good news about the Messiah. So these Christians in Philippi, they were living in a hotbed of Roman patriotism. But their way of life was to be shaped by another king, Jesus. 
and that might bring persecution. But they are not to be afraid because suffering for being associated with Jesus, it's a way of living out the story of Jesus himself. Which leads Paul into the great poem of chapter 2. It's rich with echoes of Old Testament texts, specifically the story of Adam and his rebellion in Genesis 1-3, through and the poems about the suffering servant in the book of Isaiah. This poem is worth committing to memory. It is a beautifully condensed version of the gospel story. So before becoming human, the Messiah pre-existed in a state of glory and equality with God. And unlike Adam, who tried to seize equality with God, the Messiah chose not to exploit his equal status for his self-advantage. Rather, he emptied himself of status. He became a human. He became a servant to all. And even more than that, he allowed himself to be humiliated. He was obedient to the Father by going to his death on a Roman execution rack. But through God's power and grace, the Messiah's shameful death has been reversed through the resurrection. And now God has highly exalted Jesus as the king of all, bestowing upon him the name that is above all names, so that all creation should recognize that Jesus the Messiah is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now that last statement is astounding. Paul's quoting from Isaiah chapter 45. It's a passage where all creation comes to recognize the God of Israel as Lord. Paul's point here is very clear. In the crucified and risen Jesus, we discover that the one true God of Israel consists of God the Father and the Lord Jesus. And so for Paul, this poem, it expresses his convictions about who Jesus is, and it does more. It offers the example of Jesus as a way of life that his followers are to imitate. And so that's why Paul immediately goes on to tell two stories, first about Timothy, then about Epaphroditus, because they are both examples of people living out Jesus' story. So Timothy's like Jesus because he's constantly concerned for the well-being of other people more than his own. And Epaphroditus, who the Philippians sent with their gift, he ended up risking his life to serve Paul in prison. He got so sick he almost died trying to help Paul. But God had mercy on him and Paul by sparing him the loss of a friend. Paul's point here is that these are the kinds of people who are living, breathing examples of the story of Jesus, and they are worthy of imitation. Paul then turns to his own story as an example. So those Christians who had been demanding circumcision of non-Jewish Christians, remember his letter to the Galatians, these people are still stirring up trouble for Paul, and they keep reminding him of his own past. When he used to persecute Jesus' followers, when he tried to show his right standing before God by his zealous obedience to the laws of the Torah. But like Jesus, Paul has given up all of that status and privilege. He now regards all of it as filth. And the word he uses is actually much less polite. He's given it all up to become a servant, like Jesus, to participate in his suffering and sacrificial love. And he does all of it in the hope that Jesus' love will carry him through death and out the other side into resurrection. So Paul says that for followers of Jesus, their true citizenship is in heaven, which for Paul does not mean that we should all hope to get away from earth and go to heaven one day. Rather, heaven is the transcendent place where Jesus reigns as king. And he says we're eagerly awaiting our royal savior to come from there and return here to bring his kingdom of healing justice and transforming love to bring about a new creation. Paul then challenges the Philippians to keep living out the Jesus story. He first addresses two prominent women leaders in the church who worked alongside Paul, and they're in some kind of conflict. And so Paul pleads with them to follow Jesus' example of humility, to reconcile and become unified. Paul then urges the Philippians not to give in to fear, but despite their persecution, to vent all of their emotion and their needs to God, who will give them peace. And that peace, Paul says, it comes by focusing your thoughts on what is good and true and lovely. There's always something that you could complain about, but a follower of Jesus knows that all of life is a gift and can choose to see beauty and grace in any life circumstance. Which leads Paul to his conclusion. He again thanks the Philippians for their sacrificial gift, and he wants them to know that his imprisonments, that his times of poverty, that these are not true hardships for him. They've actually become his his greatest teachers, showing him that no matter his circumstances, he has learned the secret of contentment. It's simple dependence on the one who strengthens him. 
Paul has come to see his own suffering as a participation in the story of Jesus. The letter to the Philippians gives us a unique window into Paul's own heart and mind. He saw his entire life as a reenactment of the story of Jesus. And you can sense in this letter his close connection to Jesus, his awareness that Jesus' love and presence is closer than his own skin. And that's what gave him hope and humility in his darkest hours. And so Paul shows us that knowing Jesus is always a deeply personal, transforming encounter. That's the kind of Jesus that Paul invites others to follow. And that's what Paul's letter to the Philippians is all about. Okay, so now we can get into Philippians chapter 1. Let's go over to Philippians chapter 1. Okay, here we go. I think, no, I don't think that we need to continue to read the whole thing first. I think we can just get into it. The Philippians chapter one, we're basically just gonna call this um, the opening of the letter, okay? The opening of the letter because there's a lot of different themes here. <clears throat> okay, so not necessarily just one theme that we can call the entire chapter. So look at verses one through eight. Verses 1 through 8 is opening encouragement and sincerity. Opening encouragement and sincerity. Look what it says in 1 through 8. Pablo y Timoteo, siervos de Jesucristo, a todos los santos en Cristo Jesús que están en fe Filipos, con los obispos y diáconos. Gracia y paz a vosotros de, de Dios nuestro Padre y del Señor, Señor um, Jesucristo. Doy gracias a mi Dios siempre que me acuerdo de vosotros, siempre en todas mis oraciones rogando con gozo por todos vos, vosotros, por vuestra comunión en el evangelio desde el primer día hasta ahora, estando persuadido de esto que el que comenzó en vosotros la buena obra la perfeccionará hasta el día de Jesucristo. Como me es justo sentir esto de todos vosotros, por cuanto os tengo en el corazón, y en mis prisiones, y en la defensa, y en confirmación del evangelio, todos vosotros sois participantes conmigo de la gracia. Porque Dios me es testigo de cómo os amo a todos vosotros con el entranable, entranable amor de Jesucristo. Okay, so like I said, it's encouragement and sincerity from Paul. He is sincerely thankful for these people, right? He opens up the letter, Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ to all the saints. So he's writing on behalf of both of them, right? And with all the people there at the church of Philippi. In verse number two, he get, you know, he's saying grace to them and peace to them from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul always sets up his authority. Who is his authority? God and Jesus Christ. Who is he based in? What's his foundation? God and Jesus Christ. He never points to himself, right? He talks about how much he loves them. He talks about how thankful he is for them. But it's after he points to Jesus Christ, right? Then verse 3, one of the most beautiful verses to express your thankfulness for somebody in the ministry. Doy gracias a mi Dios siempre que me acuerdo de vosotros, right? How? Does he express his thankfulness for them? How does he express his thankfulness for them? Look at verse 4. By praying for them, right? Always in every prayer of mine from the, um, for you all, making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, right? So he prays for them. That's how he expresses his thankfulness, not just telling them, right? But even when he's not with them, he thinks about them and prays for them. And then in verse um, number 6, also one of the most famous verses and um, taken out of chapter one a lot of times, but not out of context because this verse basically has its own context, I would think. You could say because it stands alone. Estando persuadido de esto, de what? Que el que comenzó en vosotros la buena obra la perfeccionará hasta el día de Jesucristo. Guys, that's a confidence right there because... Here's the thing, I was thinking about this when I read this verse the other day and I never thought about it, but this is a verse about not losing your salvation as well as everything else. The confidence that, you know, hey, look, if we fall into sin or if we 
step back from Jesus Christ, guess what? He's still doing a work in us. Because he's going to do it until the day of Jesus Christ. That means he's going to do it until he comes back for us. He promises that, right? So he's going to keep working on us. He's going to start throwing things in our life to bring us back to him, right? Because that's what it says right here. Also, when we look at it and we're discouraged and we say like, I can't do anything right. I can't. <clears throat> I'm not a mature Christian. I can't get to the point where I'm a mature, mature Christian. Why can't I say no to this sin? Why do I keep being tempted by this? Why do I keep falling into temptation from this? Why do I feel like I'm not being, I'm, I'm not able to be used by God? No, 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 no. Here's your promise right here. Que el que comenzó en vosotros la buena obra, la perfeccionará hasta el día de Jesucristo. So when I realized that this is a verse also for the confidence in your salvation, I was thinking, you know what? That is one evidence about not losing your salvation. Paul talked to these Christians. Remember in Corinthians, he said, you're carnal Christians. You're living like you're in, you're living like the world, right? But did he ever say, watch out, you're going to lose your salvation? No, he didn't. He said, look, he's going to keep working in you. Hey, look, you need to get to the point where you want meat from the word of God, not just milk from the word of God, right? He continued to encourage them and speak directly to them and say, get this right. But he never said that God was going to say, like, that's it. Ya pasó el limite. No. Okay. And if if we were going to find that, Paul would be the one to tell us that. Because he worked with some Christians that were in the world, man. And he worked with every type of church, right? Ephesus was different from Philippi. Philippi, Philippi is different from Colossensus. Then um, you have the church at Corinth, right? The church at Rome. So we would have seen it in there. We don't. But this is also for those people that like, you're not worried about losing your salvation, but you just don't feel like you're growing in God. Or you feel like, man, I feel like I wasted my time here because this is not what God wanted me to do, right? No, he started a good work in you and he's going to be working on you until the day of Jesus Christ. Okay, look what it says in verse number um, seven, that he thinks of them and that everything that he does in prison, right? Everything that he does, he has them in their heart, his heart. He has them in his heart, and everything is worth it, basically, right? And look what it says. And, like, God is my testigo, my witness, in verse number eight. I long after you. I, you are my family. I love you, and I want to serve you. And I want to tell you about what God has laid on my heart for you, Right? He's completely dedicated to these people. So look what it says in verse number 9 through 11. Some of you guys know um, these are one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible because here's the prayer. Here's the powerful prayer that Paul has for his people. So that's what it's called, Paul's powerful prayer. Y esto pido en oración que vuestro amor abunde aún más y más en ciencia en todo conocimiento para que aproéis lo mejor a fin de que seáis sinceros e irreprensibles para el día de Cristo, llenos de fruto, frutos de justicia que son por medio de Jesucristo para gloria y alabanza de Dios. So quickly, what is all this talking about? He starts out by saying in verse number nine, this is his prayer for the people. This is what any leader's prayer should be for their people. That your love and bounds more and more. Then it grows more and more. In what? In knowledge and in all judgment. That means that you have one that you that you're gaining um, knowledge. Knowledge of of one the word of God. Two what you need to gain knowledge for to be the servant God, that God wants you to be. And then discernment, sabiduría, wisdom. Right? Because that's what it says right here. In in todo conocimiento. In um in English, it says, in all judgment, right? Why? So why does he want you to grow in love and grow in knowledge and grow in wisdom? So that you can aproveis lo mejor, right? So that means that you do things that are excellent. It says in, in English, that you may approve things that are excellent. Approve meaning like you say, this is for me and this is not for me. I'm not gonna go down this road because that's not excellence for God. That's not glory to God. Right? But I am going to go down this road because this is how I'm going to do my work with excellence for him. Which is really cool because we talk about that all the time. And then when I saw that it was right there in the Bible, aproves lo mejor, I was like, what? That is the coolest thing ever. Okay, that's what God, Jesus wants for us as well. Why? Okay, so now why does he want us to grow in love, grow in knowledge, grow in wisdom? Approve lo mejor, 
right? Do things with excellence. Why? A fin de que seáis sinceros. No hypocrisy. No acting like you, uh, how you think everybody wants you to act. But that you sincerely love God and that you sincerely want to do his work. And what? Irreprensibles. That means more and more becoming like Jesus Christ and more and more leaving the sin of the world behind. Right? You more and more become perfeccionados. We're never going to be perfect, but we can be way far away from sin. We don't have to be a slave to sin and we don't have to be marked by sin. When people look at our lives, they can say that that's a person that's living for God. And that is what he's saying. Para el día de Cristo. So just like Jesus in Ephesians tells us that his relationship with us is that he wants to get us ready for the day of Jesus Christ. Paul says, that's my carga too. That's my desire too. That's what God's put in my heart too. To get you ready for the day of Jesus Christ, the judgment where he says, it's true, nobody's perfect, but wow, you did a lot for me. Thank you for showing me how much, how grateful you were for me while you were on this earth with the one life that you have to live, right? How too? What's it going to look like? What's it going to look like when we're getting ready for, for the day of Jesus Christ? One sincero, one irreprensible. Look what it says. Lleno de fruta de justicia. Que son por medio de Jesucristo. Para gloria y alabanza de Dios. So that you're going to have fruit of righteousness. Meaning that people are going to see that you do right. People are going to see that you live for God. And that only comes from Jesus Christ, it says. You got to be close to him. You got to be asking for forgiveness. You got to be asking him to clean your heart. You got to be asking him to help you live for him. Be laying down your life every day, taking up his cross every day, and making it your goal in life to fulfill his purpose, right? That's what his prayer was. Why? To glorify and give praise to God, okay? My favorite part of this chapter. Look at verses 12 through 17. God is using his plight for good. Okay, I wanted to teach you that word, so that's why I put it in here. Plight. P-L-I-G-H-T. God is using his, Paul's, plight for good. Plight is your um, tinieblas, okay? Your problems. The, the obstacle in your life right now. That's your plight. So, Paul, there. look, the Philippi Philippians are worried about him. The Philippians want to know how he's doing. The prison, the, you know, just like I said in the video, the prison system was horrible in those times. Okay, disgusting. And so they want to know, is he okay? And they feel bad that he's in jail for trying to do what's right, right? But look what he says. He has complete confidence in this. He says, this is all working out for good. Don't you worry. Okay, 12 through 17. Quiero que sepáis, hermanos, que las cosas que me han sucedido han redundado más bien para el progreso del evangelio. Okay, he says, look, this is... This is advancing the gospel, man. This is cool stuff. I understand that you guys are worried that I'm in jail. Probably not his favorite place to be. But this has really been an, an advance for the gospel of Christ. De tal manera que mis prisiones se han hecho patentes en Cristo en todo el pretorio y a todos los demás. Because now, look, everybody knows why he's there. Everybody, he's claiming the word of Jesus Christ to the guards, the people in the palace, because everybody knows that he's there for Jesus Christ. Y la ma mayoría de los hermanos cobrando ánimo en el Señor con mis prisiones se atrevan mucho más a hablar la palabra sin temor. And outside the prison, his hermanos in Christ are getting más valor because they're saying like, look, if Paul is willing to go to prison for this like 50 bazillion times, right, and willing to die because that might happen, hey, I can, I can talk about Jesus Christ. So they're getting, they're cobrando ánimo, right? Algunos a la verdad predican a Cristo por envidia y contienda, pero otros de buena voluntad. So he says, look, I know that there's some out there with the wrong motives, misrepresenting Christ, but then there's some with good ones. Los unos anuncian a Cristo por con contención, no sinceramente, pensando, an, pensando, a, pensando <laughs> añadir aflicción a mis prisiones, pero los otros por amor, sabiendo que estoy puesto para la defensa del evangelio. I love how he throws that in there. Like, guys, I know. Don't worry. I know that there's people out there that, one, don't support me. It definitely don't support the real gospel of Jesus Christ. And they're claiming that they do. Right? Don't worry. I know. I'm not decepcionados. Because there's other people that are there out, out there sinc sinceramente. That teaches me a lot because we as humans are just going to look at the bad. Right? We're going to look at the negative. We're going to look at what we're trying to do for Jesus Christ. And we're going to see, like... 
this is against me, this is against me, these people aren't sincere, this is hypocrisy, blah, blah, blah. And that's what we focus on. That's what we get discouraged on. Paul doesn't want to focus on that, and he's choosing not to. He says, look, I know, I know. But hey, there's people out there that are working for Jesus Christ, and I'm going to focus on that, right? So that's 12 through 17. Then 18 through 20 is Christ is preached. Look what it says. Que pues. Que no absante de todas maneras, or por pretexto, or por verdad, Cristo es anunciado. In esto me gozo, y mo, me gozaré aún. Look, no matter what, Christ is being preached out there. I'm in here, I'm going to keep preaching Christ. And I know Christ is being preached out there, so nothing's going to get me down. Right? 19. Porque sé que por vuestra oración y la suministración del Espíritu de Jesucristo, Esto resultará en mi liberación. Conforme a mi anhelo y esperanza de que en nada seré avergonzado. Antes bien, con toda confianza, como siempre, ahora también será magnificado Cristo en mi cuerpo, o por vida, o por muerte. Okay, he said, look, I'm going to be saved because of your prayer and because of the Holy Spirit. I believe he, he believes he's going to get out of jail this time. But then he also says, it doesn't matter if it's for my life or for my muerte. Jesus Christ is going to get the gloria. Now he's going to start to really reveal his, how sincere he is. Okay? Because one, he's saying, look, look, no one's going to get me down. I know that in prison, I'm still glorifying God and Christ is being preached. And I'm going to preach Christ either in my death or in, in my life. Whatever that it is. Okay, but now look, he's going to reveal what he contemplate sometime and I really love Paul's sincerity and sincerity in this look what it says in 21 through 24 Paul's irony irony is like something that you don't expect like it looks like this but it's really like this and that's Paul because he doesn't care if he dies okay you would think that people would be like oh, I don't want to die no nope, not him watch what he says 21 through 24 porque para mí el vivir es Cristo y el morir es ganancia Okay, so what does he mean by that? Mas si el vivir en la carne resulta para mí en beneficio de la obra, no sé entonces qué escoger. Porque de ambas cosas estoy puesto en estrecho, teniendo deseo de partir y estar con Cristo, lo cual es muchísimo mejor. Pero quedar en la carne es más necesario por causa de vosotros. He said, honestly, I know that you guys are like, I want you out of jail. I want you to live. And Paul is saying, yeah, me too, for you guys. But for me personally, I'm cool with dying because that means I get to go to heaven. Because listen to it. Porque para mí, el vivir es Cristo. So that means like when I'm living, I'm living for Christ, right? Which in verse 24 reveals that that's for them, por causa de vosotros. Pero morir es ganancia for me because I'm going to be with Christ, okay? So he says, I don't know what to, to escoger, what to choose. Because when I'm here, I'm living for God, but when I'm with Christ, it's muchísimo mejor. Okay, so he's in a great position. Paul's going to talk about this in verse in chapter 4. He has learned to be content with a little bit of money, with a lot of money, with death or with life. It doesn't matter. And what a cool method of having your life, right? What a cool goal to have to be like Paul. Like, hey, I don't care what happens today. Christ is being preached, and if I do die, I get to be with him. Okay, super great philosophy of life. Okay, and then the last one is 25 through 30, which is the encouragement of confidence and to keep on serving. The encouragement of confidence and to keep on serving. Look what it says. Y confiado en esto, sé que quedaré, que aún permaneceré con todos vosotros para vuestro provecho y gozo de la fe. Para que abunde vuestra gloria de mí en Cristo Jesús, por mi presencia otra vez entre vosotros. Solamente que os comportéis como es digno del evangelio de Cristo. So he is confident that he's going to be with them again, right? He's confident that this is not his time to die, basically, right? So but look what he says. But here's the thing. Here's my, my edificación to you. That's what you got to keep on doing. Comportéis como es digno del evangelio de Cristo para que os sea que vaya or a veros, or que esté ausente. Oiga de vosotros que estáis firmes, 
en un mismo espíritu, combate, combatiendo unánimes por la fe del evangelio. He said, look, no matter where I am, though, let me hear this about you. Let me hear about you, that you're walking how Jesus wants you to walk. And that you are standing in one spirit, in unity, for the cause of Christ. Right? Y en nada intimidados por los que se oponen, para que, que para ellos ciertamente es in, indicio de perdición. Más para vosotros de salvación y esto de Dios. That you're not... You're not listening to the enemies. You're not getting that discouragement in your head. Porque a vosotros os es concedido a causa de Cristo, no solo que creáis en él, sino también que parezcáis por él. Teniendo el mismo conflicto que habéis visto en mí, y ahora oís que hay en mí. Okay? So... It says in um, English, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which ye saw in me, and now here to be in me. There's going to be conflict. There's going to be suffering. But it's for him. Okay? It is for him. Live for him. Let me hear that from you. I don't, no matter where I am. In prison in another city. Dying. Let me hear it from you that you're living for Christ. And that you're okay with suffering for him. Right? That's chapter one. Huh? Super cool, right? Powerful, powerful book. Okay. So all I need to see from you today is notes from the video, notes from the chapter. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for teaching us the example of Paul. That if we are truly sold out to you, tr truly dedicated to you, we can have that animal. That we can be fully dedicated to the people that you have us to serve. And be encouraged no matter what state we're in. We love you so much in Jesus' name. Amen. Bye, guys. Have a great day.